How did you end up in San Francisco? My family come in from uh, Italy, and they they uh, went to West Virginia, uh, worked in the coal mines, and then they they eventually moved out to California uh, to work in the steel mills, and uh, so that's how we got out, you know, to California. Now, uh, I'll settle settle in a little town uh, called uh, Antioch, uh, Antioch, A-N-T-I-O-C-H, and it was only, population was only about 3,500. And I uh, went to high school, and then and from there went in, into the Army. Uh, but going into the Army was a real good thing for me because it gave me uh, discipline and uh, really, really uh, kept me in shape. And then when I uh, got out of the Army, I went back to Antioch, and I wanted to play some football, so I uh, organized a semi-pro team. And, you know, and that was tough because you had to go around to the grocery store, the the liquor store, the bars, and collect money for the uh, uniforms. And uh, we did that, and uh, we had a, you know, did a pretty good team, and I, and on the team was my brother, uh, who was a, a lot better football player than I was. Uh, so uh, one one day, it was really a, a lucky thing for her, for me, we were driving down. We were going up to the Bay Area and play a team in, in San Francisco. Uh, so uh, as we're leaving the town, I noticed where my house, uh, there was a red Chevrolet, and my mother uh, lived there. So we said, let's go see who it is. Uh, so my brother and I drove down, and uh, inside was... Uh, Stan Pafko, a line coach from Modesto Junior College, and uh, Johnson, the head coach of the football team at, at Modesto. So, uh, you know, they talked to my brother. They wanted, really wanted my brother and this other to come up there and go to that college. And uh, so as they started to leave the house, uh, my brother had committed, and he was going to go up to Modesto Junior College. So we all said our, our goodbyes, and I went and told seen the line coach and told him goodbye, shook his hand, and he made a, a joke. He says, you look like you're big enough to uh, play. Why don't, you, uh, why, don't you, why don't you come up? And I said, I would. So I did go up, and... Uh, First, my brother, he made first team right away. It took me about three weeks. And then from there, I was recruited by uh, Joe Carrick and Brad Lynn uh, to go up to the university and play uh, play uh, football and go to school there. And so that's, uh, that's where we started. And then I we went up to the University of San Francisco and... Uh, Things worked out well there, and then I ended up going to being drafted by Baltimore. What did your folks think of all this? Didn't like it. My uh, my mother and father, uh, you know, being from Italy, uh, you know, they didn't know much about football. So uh, when uh, when I started to play and wanted to play, uh, you know, I had to fight them. Uh, all the way. Uh, they didn't want me to play. Uh, they were afraid that uh, I'd, I'd get injury. I'd get hurt. Uh, so they, they weren't very happy with me. But I, I held something over them, over their head. I said, well, if I don't play football, I'm just not going to school. When I'm 16, I'm out of there. And so uh, they signed up, and and they let me play, go out to the university. I mean, out in Antioch, the high school. 
Uh, and an interest, interesting thing about that is when going out to football there, they had 24 uniforms. And uh, I didn't make the team. Uh, but I still like wanted wanted to play, and so a friend of mine was uh, was a manager of of the, of the football team, uh, an equipment manager, and uh, he gave me a pair of pants, shoulder pad, and I practiced with the team for the whole year, uh, not going to any games, not being able to play, but I just I just uh, tagged along, you might say. And then, then my second year, I played a little, and then third year, you know, I started to improve. And that's uh, that's where it all really started and how it started. You were in the Battle of the Bulge. What was that like? What, the, uh, the Army? Yeah, the Battle of the Bulge. You were in that uh, battle. Yeah, well, uh, what happened is... Uh, uh, and I and I, I don't know why I did this. Uh, uh, I had uh, I like to say I was very patriotic and uh, this and that, but I really wasn't. Uh, one day uh, I left Annie uh, high school to go home, picked up my girl, and I said uh, I'm going to out of the blue. I said I'm joining the army. So at 17, I started the paperwork to join the army. And then uh, my mother didn't like that, or my father didn't like that. So I gave him that same spiel. If I, you don't let me join, I'm not going to school. So they let me join, and I joined the Army in, in, in 44. And, and, and from there, uh, went to uh, Mississippi. Uh, and then I joined the 69th Infantry Division in Europe, and uh, that's where we got into action. Uh, we, uh, I know they always uh, say that I was in the Battle of Bulge. Actually, I was in part of it. But by the time I got there, it was uh, uh, the, the Bulge uh, had been stopped, and uh, we started moving forward. So, um, uh, but the army was good, I think, because as I said before, as it taught me discipline, and I think uh, every kid today, if they spent a year when they got out of high school and in the service, uh, uh, so that, uh, and then I was over there for two years, so uh, and I and I enjoyed that, so. And then when I come home is when I decided I was going to try to play football. I never never thought of playing professional football because uh, I, I wasn't that big. And and professional football wasn't that big at that time either. No, no, it was. Uh, Forty Niners were in uh, San Francisco. We had the Los Angeles. Uh, Rams out in California, so uh, no, it wasn't very, very big and popular at all. Uh, so, uh, but, now when you went to the University of San Francisco and Joe Kuharik was your coach, did did you have any idea who he was? That he, you know, had played at Notre Dame and he had played uh, professionally. No, yeah, the first guy I met and the guy that really uh, was was uh, trying to get me in there was a guy by the name of Brad Lynn. Uh, I don't know what school he went to. Uh, uh, so, But he was, the, he was the main guy that tried to get me to, uh, to go to the University of San Francisco. And uh, I can remember today uh, I was working in, in the bar, and I was tending bar, and uh, all of a sudden this guy comes in with a suit and a tie. And uh, I don't wonder what he wanted because in that little town, most of were working bars, you know, guys going to shifts mm -hmm. and coming home. And he introduced himself and uh, he said, uh, I said, well, what are you doing here? He says, well, we'd like you to come up to USF and uh, try to play football for the University of San Francisco. 
And at that time, I was smoking a cigarette, and I'll never forget. I took that cigarette and I put it out, you know, because I didn't want him to think I was smoking. So that's that's what happened. And then uh, they made a big uh, rah-rah about uh, I, I reported uh, to the University of San Francisco on the following Monday, and went in to meet uh, Joe, uh, Joe Harry. And at that time, I was riding a motorcycle. So uh, uh, me and my friend drove up to San Francisco and uh, went in to see Joe. And uh, he wasn't very imp- uh, impressed with me because, I guess because motorcycles or drivers or riders have a, a bad reputation. But we didn't have a bad re- reputation, but I had a leather jacket which uh, everybody had to have if you were riding a motor. And uh, uh, you bought a leather jacket, and uh, on this leather jacket, uh, the more zippers you had, the better it was. You know, uh, you, know you, felt, you felt really cool, you know. So I had like 17 zippers, one zipper on top of the other, and, and, but anyway, the meeting between Joe and I didn't go very well uh, because, uh, you know, I wasn't, you know, the Notre Dame type, I guess, that he was used to uh, when he played there. And he also coached a little, uh, you know, a little there. Uh, but uh, Bradlin talked him into him. Bradlin said, uh, you don't, don't worry, the kid can play football. And so uh, we went out, uh, and Joe Carrick was practicing the, the USF about from, uh, I think, uh, January to June. You know, he, he, that was, you know, full scale scrimmages on Saturdays. So I happened to go on this one particular day, and uh, it was on a Saturday, and and he got the, got the equipment, and I worked out with him. And then when it went to scrimmage, he put me in the scrimmage. And, uh, you know, I wasn't dumb. You know, I knew that uh, they were going to try to run me, run me, run over me, run inside, outside, or just to see if I had any ability at all. And so after that practice, uh, uh, Joe Carrick told Brad Lynn, he says, you bring him in, and so that's uh, that was my lucky day. And you went both ways, you and Bob Sinclair. You played what offensive line and defensive line. Yeah, yeah. At that time, most of the schools were were playing. The bigger schools uh, had all, an offense and a defense, but uh, little schools like you know University of San Francisco, we played both ways, or we played. Uh, uh, a pretty uh, light schedule, not a light schedule, but uh, we played Stanford once and, and Cal, but most of them were all little uh, Catholic schools like St. Mary's, Santa Clara, uh, and, and that that type. What was your question? Oh no, I'm just saying basically that you were going both ways, and you had some great. Oh yeah. Players. You had some great players on that team. It was you, Bob Sinclair, Ollie Madsen, three Hall of Famers. You had Dick Stanfield, who should be in the Hall of Fame, and you had yeah. uh, Tovar. I mean, you were loaded. Yeah, Bro- yeah. Bro- we Tovar. had uh, we had nine guys off that at, off that one team um, that uh, went into the professional level and made the teams. You know. Uh, you mentioned like the, our backfield at that time was Ollie Matson's, who was in the Hall of Fame. Ed Brown uh, was a uh, quarterback. Uh, Scooter Scudero was the other halfback, and then there was Bob St. Clair, uh, Dick Stanfell, and one of the best football players on that team. And I've said this I don't know a trillion times was. Uh, Burl Toller, he was a black athlete, and he was a damn good one. And uh, he was probably the best athlete of, of all of us. And St. Clair was there. Uh, and 
Burrow was drafted when he was a, a junior, and uh, but uh, you know we had some uh, pretty good studs. I guess some of those guys, like myself, and there was a couple other and I, guys I can't think that was from the service. So uh, that's where a lot of the leadership on the team come from because of the guys in the service or naturally were a little older than everybody else and uh, realized uh, that how lucky we were to get another chance to play. So we kept uh, we kept working pretty hard. Yeah. Now, the, the Cleveland Browns had drafted Burl Toller, and then I guess yes. he, he injured his knee in the college all-star game. Any, yeah. any idea how good he would have been in the NFL as a player? Oh, I, I definitely be- think he had been a Hall of Famer, no question about it. I, I never seen a big guy, particularly – uh, yeah, offense, it, it was great balance, uh, you know. He had legs uh, about the size of birds, but, you know, he wasn't built that strong, but he was that strong, and he played uh, offensive tackle, and he played uh, middle linebacker and uh, did an excellent job. And matter of fact, at the college all-star game, that's the reason... And I always say that, uh, you know, he, he was played hard, uh, you know, and uh, he was the only one of us that made first first string or, or started the All-Star game, mainly because uh, when you go to those All-Star games, a lot of times uh, they got Big Ten coaches, uh, Pac-10, they got all, uh, you know, uh, right. the big schools. And here you are from USF, and the uh, coaches always took care of the guys that you know they coached in, in college, and and he he broke in uh, first string and and on the first or second play on a college all star game, uh, the Rams ran a sweep around his side, and uh, and he took the he took everything down, you know, and stopped stopped the play. But the problem is he didn't get up, uh, and, uh, and it tore up his knee terrible. And then in the locker room after, I was standing there talking uh, to Eric, and Burrow was coming out of the shower, and I says, how do you feel, Burrow? He says, I don't know. I don't think I'm going to make it. And he took a step, and the and, uh, knee just went, and he, he, he fell completely down. And he okay. never, never did recover from the knee injury because uh, uh, they didn't have much experience them days on torn ligaments and, and that type of thing. Uh, and that's what he had. So that ruined his, uh, his professional career. But he would have been, uh, he would have been uh, the tops. Not only that, but one of the greatest uh, he was voted captain, uh, one of the greatest uh, individual you'll ever meet. When you went undefeated at San Francisco and you turned down the chance to play in the bowl game, whose decision was that? Our decision. And why did it you- was, we, uh, the thing that led up to it is that uh, our senior year, we were, we were untied. You know, uh, we were uh, not untied. But uh, we were undefeated, and we were coming up to the last game or the last big game on our schedule, and that was the College of, of Pacific. And they had, like, uh, Eddie LeBaron. I don't know. He played uh, four or five years in a pro. He was a quarterback. And they were undefeated. So we played them, and uh, we beat them 47 to nothing or something. I mean, we, we really gave them a whipping. And then they come down that uh, before the game that uh, some people were looking at us to go to, uh, to a bowl game. I don't know whether they were looking at us or College of Pacific because they were, they were awfully good also. But, but the way we manhandled them that afternoon was that I guess they decided to take a, take us. And, and, but the only problem they had, they wanted us to, uh, 
uh, to go and leave uh, Burl Toller and Ollie Matson home, the black players. And uh, when they asked me about it, I said, uh, hell no. You know, they're part of this team. I was the captain, too. I says, uh, if they don't go, we don't go. I don't go. I don't care. Uh, you know, and then the t- whole team took that approach that that uh, we would not go without the whole whole team. And uh, uh, what was really great about it is that everybody stood together on it. You didn't hear uh, one guy a little upset saying, right, I, you know, we should go. You know, we'll never get another chance or, or that type of uh, stuff. Never heard it. And when we said we weren't going, that was it. The uh, subject was dropped. Uh, and we never, never regretted that decision. And uh, but that's what's that's the way things go. It was uh, tough in, in those days, like for black athletes. I guess uh, I never knew that because California, you know, it was, was never really a problem. But then the professionally. Uh, it was tough on them because they, a lot of uh, places where we went down south to play, uh, the black athletes had to go to a different part of town uh, than we were. We, we couldn't stay together, and uh, I, we didn't like that. And I didn't like that, but there was nothing we could do about it. Now, you got drafted by the Dallas Texans, who became the Baltimore Colts. What what was, were you anticipating going on to play professionally? No, no, I I, uh, I n- never thought uh, that I could ever make a professional team because uh, of my size. Uh, I was uh, tall, six five or six six, but I only weighed two twenty, fifteen to two twenty, and at that time. Uh, it's no different now, you know. The, the people think during the early, early years of a professional football player that uh, they weren't big. And I'll tell you one thing: they were big. <laughs> they uh, drafted the guys because of their size or whatever, and uh, they drafted uh, they drafted me. And uh, I only weighed, like I say, two twenty. And when I reported to camp. Uh, I used to, when they had weigh-ins, I put a 10-pound weight in my jock strap, so I'd weigh 230, 230, 235, and then they'd look at me a little better, I guess. But eventually, I could throw the jock strap, I, I, I could throw the weight away, you know, because uh, we, 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 we made it, and uh, it wasn't a very good season, you know, and we were terrible, but... Uh, got to play, and then uh, when they went to Baltimore, that's the Art Donovan. Uh, he kept telling me, Gino, you're going to love it there. You're going to love People are great. And, you know, it's going to be a lot better than Texas. So uh, it sure was. We moved to Baltimore, and the fans uh, were great to us, and, and I think our team was great to, to them, too, because – uh, we used to go out and sign autographs uh, every night, practically, and and do those type of things that uh, the other teams would never do. Everyone talked about the Colts offense with Raymond Berry, um, Johnny Unitas, uh, Lenny Moore, but that defense was solid too with you and Art Donovan. I mean, you you guys were loaded too. Well, yeah, we had a. Uh, we had a great, uh, great defensive team, I think, and and, and mainly because uh, we didn't blitz much. We got we could rush the passer, and we can uh, cover the runs and screens, and and really really play pretty well. Uh, but uh, excuse me, but uh, we didn't. The defense, uh, i tell you who was on it. Let me get a thinking here. i got to get my head on. We had Art Donovan, of course. He's, he was in the Hall of Fame. 
uh, Big Big Daddy Liskin, who was six, seven, uh, three hundred pounds probably. We had a guy named Don Joyce. Uh, let's see, myself and uh, Odell Bracy, who was an excellent defensive end. And uh, the, um, we had a great middle linebacker, Bill Pellington. So we got everything done that we wanted to do on a game just with those guys. We didn't have to blitz uh, like sometimes some some players uh, uh, are lucky. If, if you play with a team like uh, the, uh, the Eagles, for instance, you know, they, they blitz almost 40% of the time. So that gives you a lot more chances to get sacks or, or to show what you got a little better than just, uh, just, you know, just playing a regular defense. Uh, and we played a regular defense, and we got the pass rush and uh, everything else. And uh, offensively, uh, you couldn't find a better receiver than uh, Raymond Berry, a better halfback than Lenny Moore. Alan Michi was there at uh, fullback, and uh, Unitas played uh, quarterback, and he was as good of a quarterback as a, as ever played the game. And uh, not only that, but he was one of the nicest guys uh, that uh, we had on our team. And uh, I say that uh, because we, I shouldn't say it like that because Every guy on our club was really, really nice. Uh, there was no dissension. There was, we all got along good, and it was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, didn't make much money, but it was a hell of a lot of fun uh, playing in Baltimore. Did you guys get good when Reed Eubank came in? Was that the difference? Yeah, it started there. Uh, when I reported to the Texans, they had a coach named Jimmy Phelan. I don't know if he ever knew what football was. Uh, we didn't uh, work for, we worked hard, but never seen a film or, you know, our our meetings were short. Uh, our scouting reports were terrible. It was just a poor, poorly run organization. Matter of fact, we only stayed uh, in that uh, town uh, five uh, five games and uh, and they declared bankruptcy so, and we were a, a traveling team then uh, we lived in Hershey uh, and uh, stayed at the Hershey hotels and uh, go to work uh, every day and then uh, play uh, all of our games on the road you know which that was that was okay. That was fun. You know. I think little, that little. I, I think they went broke uh, paying for Art Donovan's food bill. <laughs> I think or or, or his sweats. <laughs> uh, Art Donovan, uh, God Almighty, he never he, he he would never hardly eat, even though he was, he was big as a cow. Uh, he uh, his, his diet was hamburgers. Hot dogs, uh, Jewish uh, bologna, or whatever they call it. That was just uh, and spaghetti uh, and pizza. That was his diet. I never seen him eat a salad or anything, vegetables or anything. That's that was that was his dinner. You know. He and, fought, uh, he fought the battle of the bulge too. Who already? Yeah. No, <laughs> no, not, not really. Uh, the bulge Artie, in the middle, or he didn't care if he was heavy. Big pardon. He didn't care if he was heavy. Already happy? No, already didn't care if he was uh, heavy, overweight. Oh well, well I'd say them days what they did, uh, and uh, why that ten pounds in my jock track was so important was that uh, they weighed you in. And one thing he did was weigh you in every week. We would weigh you in. And uh, he'd give you away, like uh, you know, you get a letter during the off season from Weeb, and he'll he'll tell you report to camp, ready to hit, and do this and do that. And by the way, we want you to report at two forty. 
I had a weight of 240. I was 20 pounds under. That's why I, 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 wore, I went in with the weight. Uh, Artie, uh, he played about 286. But during the weigh-in, he would starve himself till, till he reached the weight that we wanted him to, 277. And that's what he, when we had weigh-in, and he had to, and, and what was tough about that, they never tell you, well, we're going to weigh you Wednesday, we're going to weigh you Thursday. And they would never tell you. So those guys that had a weight problem, uh, they hardly ate until they got weighed in. Uh, and and uh, during the game, of course, Artie was uh, weighed in once, uh, 277. But by, by the time uh, uh, we got to the game and playing the game on Sunday, he was probably 285. That they, they pumped themselves up. Uh, with food, I mean, uh, or liquids, you know, they went. Uh, those guys that had problems, uh, I tell you one, uh, like Don Joyce, uh, we gave him two forty-five, and he reported at camp at two seventy-five, and then uh, and by way, and he was down to two forty-five that night. He, uh, he, he weighed 245. We'd go out and, and after practice and all that and have a couple beers maybe. Uh, hell, he weighed 280. Or after our Donovan with those chicken eating contests he talked about. Uh, well, we, we never had a chicken. That's Art Donovan. Art, <laughs> Art Donovan, he tells all these stories uh, over and over, and each time he, he, he tells a story, he gets uh, one part from there, over here, one part from over there, and uh, they're always funny, you know. But he may have the same story he, five times. But we we never uh, Joyce was the champ of the eating contest, and he, uh, no eating of eating period. So we just ate, we were talking, and we just ate a lot of chicken. We weren't having no no contest because. I would never try. I would never challenge him because I would could never beat him. <laughs> now, but, another one of your teammates with the Colts was a, a defensive back by the name of Don Shula. Did, yeah. did you, have, you ever imagine how? First of all, how was he as a player? And did, secondly, did you ever think he would go on to become a, a Hall of Fame coach? Well, yeah. First of all, take care of that. I, he uh, uh, he he. I knew we knew that uh, he was going to be a, a Hall of Fame coach. Everybody knew that uh, because uh, hell, uh, when he come and got traded to Baltimore, uh, he practically coached the defense then when he was a young player. You know because uh, Charlie Winters, Weeb's uh, son-in-law was a defensive coordinator, and he didn't know a hell of a lot about the professional uh, way of doing things. And, and Shula used to teach him. So we knew that, that he would uh, he would become a, a very fine uh, coach. And as a player, uh, the only thing, uh, uh, he was a player, uh, not a great player, but uh, capable, and I th think mainly because he was so smart that uh, you know he knew the patterns of the opposition that were playing uh, and all of that. So he was a good, uh, good player. But he didn't have the speed like a lot of these guys had. Uh, but he did a damn good job, and mo uh, mostly because of his abilities uh, to know the defenses. That 58 championship game, they call it the greatest game ever played. Uh, yeah. What, what are your thoughts on that game? Well, I, I thought, uh, you know, it, it, well, you got to love the game because it made pro professional football. Uh, it made it uh, because that that uh, was the only game that uh, in, in, in the NFL history that uh, – Ended up in a tie, 
And the thing that was funny about that is when a game ended in a time tie, we didn't know, well, the coaches didn't know, I guess the ownership didn't know, what are we going to do? You know, you can't end a championship game in a tie. It's just never been done. So then that's, that's when they, uh, the word come down because Burt Bell was in the, uh, at the game, and he, he said, well, we'll play, and uh, uh, first score wins, and that's, that's, that's what we did. But I, as far as uh, the greatest game I ever played, uh, I didn't think, it, I really didn't think uh, it was. I, I think it, we, there was a lot of mistakes made. I think uh, Gifford fumbled two or three times. We fumbled twice. And, uh, but the ending, ending was exciting. When you made that but, tackle on Frank Gifford, and when you broke your leg, Gifford, yeah. Gifford insists that he got the first down, but Raymond Berry said no. Gifford's knee was down. He bounced up, and the other yard he got after his knee touched the ground, so he was down. What do you think about that? Well, they, they proved that uh, on a big screen, uh, I don't know, some scientists uh, they had a way of measuring, uh, taking measurements off, huh? Laser. It was laser. Laser light, and and they they did it. They they went through the whole play, where he went down, where the yard line was before. He was nine inches. Yeah, my wife's telling me he's not, he was nine inches short. <laughs> but you know, he, he always tells me that too. He says, you know, Gino, I made that first. Now, I says, Frank, who's got the ring? We got the ring. And that that was that was and that shut him up a little bit, just just a little. Yeah, yeah. But that uh, game, uh, I don't hear think it was so loud. I think it was almost so. Loud. Well, the newspapers were in New York were on strike. But I'll tell you this: I think if that game was played in Baltimore, uh, it would have been great, great for us. But it would have never got the courage, uh, the coverage that uh, New York uh, press and radio and television uh, gave it, and which pushed it over the hill, man. After that, the next season, uh, all the stadiums that were half full or three quarters full were all full up. The tickets were starting to get hard to get. So that's. Uh, uh, that was a fall off of, the, of that game. New York made it. After, after that season, is that when you got into the uh, the restaurant business? Yeah, I, uh, we got into the West uh, restaurant business in uh, nineteen fifty eight and fifty nine. Uh, I think we opened our first one in 58 in Baltimore, a little suburb called Dundalk. And it was uh, really successful. Uh, you know, we, we were selling 15 cent hamburgers. <laughs> uh, well, what we had done is uh, McDonald's was big in California. And so, you know, being from California, I was a little familiar with McDonald's. And uh, we went out and decided uh, to do a, a McDonald's type and call it Geno's. Uh, and uh, uh, we did that, and and they were very, very successful. And uh, we ended up with, uh, I think, 500 restaurants. Uh, we had three, 365 Geno's, uh, 120 uh, steakhouses, and uh, I don't know how many uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken take-home shops we had, but we ended up with 500 restaurants, and that was a lot of fun managing them. I saw the ball from that 1958 championship game here in Chicago at the Italian American Sports Hall of Fame. How did you end up oh. giving? How did you end up giving it to the Hall of Fame? 
Well, uh, well, I'm glad you've seen it. <laughs> no, you know, that's a different story. You know, uh, when they voted me in into the Hall of Fame, which was, you know, it's nice and, and you know, and I uh, really enjoyed it. Joe DiMaggio was there. It was really, really a hell of a, hell of a, uh, an affair. And, uh, and you had to uh, donate stuff after a while when they built this new building. They wanted you to donate something that they can put with your stuff. You know, uh, uh, is, it with, is it with my stuff? It's all by itself in a separate case. But you know what? I feel that that football should be in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, they never, uh, they gave me the game ball. Okay. Uh, the players gave me the game ball. The the thing that uh, I got a kick out of. Then they then they ask. Uh, I don't want to get this straight. Then they called up. They're building this building. They want me to donate something. I said I don't have any. I don't uh, collect things. You know, I it just never interested me. And then I says, you know, I got the I got the game ball. He says, you kidding? I says, no. I said, I got it around here somewhere. The kid's been kicking it around a little bit. <laughs> so uh, he said, could you find it and then send it to us? I says, uh, and we'll use that. I said, okay. So I found the ball, and I sent it to him. And then they put it in that cage. I've never seen it or how it's displayed. I never either. But one time I was doing a signing, and... Uh, uh, maybe the following year or two, and this this gentleman comes up to me and he says, he shows me a football and he has the score of the of, of the sudden death game. And I said, oh yeah, where did you get that? He said, well, this is the original game. We got a we we bought it for fifteen thousand bucks. I said, you bought it for fifteen thousand? He said, oh yeah, God, this is really great. And I, uh, I didn't tell him anything, but, but boy, I tell you, if he ever finds out that's a fake, that's not the game ball, you know, then uh, uh, I'd like to have the game ball back also. <laughs> it's probably worth a couple million nowadays. Oh, I don't know what it's, I don't know what it's worth, worth today. I, but say, them days, memorabilia, that stuff wasn't very, uh, I don't know. Most people weren't collecting. Their amateurs were collecting. I mean, professional autograph collectors were were grabbing all the things. But it wasn't as popular as it, as it had gotten, you know. Uh, Christ, uh, I went to a show the other night, and there was a bunch of, a, uh, a box of uh, Chino matches the guy had. He wanted me to sign him. I said, what are you saying? You know, uh, he said he paid $25 for him. Hell, and during when we were in business, you could pay for $25 to get thousands of them. <laughs> <laughs> who, who was the toughest player you went up against? Well, there's really, uh, uh, there's three guys I, I really put at the top level. Uh, one is from Cleveland, Bob Kane, and mm -hmm. uh, Forrest Gregg uh, from uh, the Packers. Uh, he was probably the smallest guy I played in front of, but uh, he was uh, he was uh, one of the best, and he's in the Hall of Fame. Kane's in the Hall of Fame, and Bob St. Clair, who I went to college with, and uh, playing against him was uh, a strange feeling. Uh, you know, at, at USF, we'd hit each other every day, you know. And then, uh, you know, have a couple beers, and, you know, we were pretty good friends. And then, and then uh, well, professionally, it was completely different. I, w I wouldn't talk to him before a game. He wouldn't talk to me. It was just... Uh, all business. Yeah, there was no laughing. You go to some of these games now, they hug each other. We never did that. Yeah, what do you say? It was a serious, serious situation. 
So I played the game without talking. If he held me, I'd kick him or something. And uh, after the game, you know, we'd see each other, go. Uh, he had a couple hours, maybe go have a couple of beers and, you know, and talk a little bit about the game and whatever, whatever. And then he'd go back to San Francisco and I'd go back to Baltimore. Uh, but uh, we wouldn't, uh, you know. He, I, would pat, I would I would never pat him on a, on the button and tell him he did a good job. Bob Sinclair told me the other day he said that he's looking forward to going to Utah to film the movie about the uh, championship at San Francisco. Yeah, yeah, I just heard that. Uh, not about the movies uh, that I heard that Bob was going to go down there. Uh, a guy come up the other day from San Francisco and told me that Bob was going to go. But I don't know. You think they'll ever pull it off? They should. I mean, they've done the Jackie Robinson story. They've done a lot of other stories, but that story yeah. should be told. Yeah, they should. I think it should, but it's kind of a lot of years. I mean, you know, small school. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I hope they do. Now, the public relations guy for uh, the University of San Francisco football team was, was a guy by the name of Pete Rosell. Yes. Who, who went on to bigger and better things as the commissioner of the NFL? He what sure did. Like didn't he? What was he like back then? Oh, God, he was, uh, you know, I'd say he was as good as our best player. He uh, uh, he was really, you know, he couldn't be he couldn't be more polite to us or he couldn't, uh, if we wanted something, we asked him, he fought like hell to get it and, uh, just you no, know, just a hell of a, a hell of a nice guy, you know. Uh, the, the only thing, I'm, you know, this is his kid. The only, the only thing I really dis, didn't like him what he did. He called one day. They called uh, Ed Brown, uh, Ed Brown, uh, myself, and uh, I don't know whether it was Stedman or, or it was uh, or. Uh, Bob, I don't, I can't remember. Uh, no, it was just, it was just uh, Ollie Matson. Uh, it wasn't Ollie Matson. It was Ed, uh, Ed Brown and myself. Carrick wanted to see us, and we went up to his office. So he he talks to us, and he says, uh, you know, I I I just want you guys to know that we're going to play uh, Fordham uh, this week, and. Uh, and it's up in New York, and uh, you three guys, if we, if I decide or the university decides, uh, if they want to push you or uh, Ed or me, that we would have a chance to become an all all America. But then he uh, he said uh, we decide that we're going to do it with Ollie. Ollie is going up to New York, and we're going to we're going to push him. And they did. That we went there first. You know, he, Ollie received the uh, kickoff and uh, almost ran it all the way down for a touchdown. He had a super game, and he, he really deserved the, uh, deserved everything uh, uh, that that he got. Uh, the thing that Pete Rozell gave him was the Catholic made the Catholic All American. Uh, plaque. So about after this, about four or five days later, Pete Rozelle wants to see me, so I go up and see him, and and he uh, he says, hey, you know, here he reaches in the drawer and gives me my Hall of Fame from uh, All American Catholic uh, uh, certificate. I said, oh, thank you. I walked out, but when he gave it to Ollie, man, he I must have 15 guys from the press. You know, it was, it was, I thought it was funny. So, When you went in the Hall of Fame, how did you feel? Well, I felt great. I felt, uh, you know, I, it was just uh, from where I come from, uh, the things that I had personally gone through, and, and not really planning it. You know, some guy says, you know, uh, I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that, or be this, or do that. I never had any goals. Uh, you know, 
it just seemed like where my right foot went, my left foot followed it. I just never, never, never planned on going to USF. Never, never thought I'd play at a professional level. And, uh, you know, never thought I'd be in the Hall of Fame. You know, it's just, uh, it's just been a great, great, great ride. You know, what could you say? You know, uh, never ran no bumps on the road, I'll tell you that. As long as and you the know, people, as long- and the people, uh, you know, the fans and uh, the players I met, uh, really, really made it, made it a good, good feeling. I think your teammate Bob Sinclair was ahead of his time, though. I mean, you had the fast food restaurants, but Bob Sinclair was into the raw food. He still eats it today. He was into sushi and all that stuff before it was popular. <laughs> yeah. yeah. One time... One time he come, he come, he come to see me in Antioch, and uh, we went to, we went out for dinner. He ordered a, a, a New York sirloin steak, and uh, it was about well, two really nice looking. When they're not cooked, you know, they looked like pretty good. So the waitress, uh, he says, "How do you want it?" He says, "I want it raw." Okay. She didn't say anything else, then question it, and I said, I want my medium rare. And when she, when she come out, Bob's was, uh, just, uh, probably hit the grill, turned it over, got it warm on the other side, just warm on the other side, and then gave him the tea blade. He says, wait a minute. He says, I, I want this thing raw. She says, what do you mean raw? I, I don't want it to touch the grill. Take it out of the refrigerator, bring it to the table, and I'll eat it. You know, and that's what I want. And, uh, they, you know, they couldn't, you could see people were, she's going around telling everybody, look, he's, he's eating a steak, it's raw. And he did. You know, he ate it for all. But uh, one time at the training camp, they had liver. And he, and he ate the liver raw. But when he ate the liver, you know, we all got the hell away from him, you know, because, uh, you know, I got blood coming down his cheekbones, and, you know, that was, it was terrible, but he he loved it. Now, you retired three times from the Colts. Yeah. What convinced, what convinced you to come back the first two? Well, the first two, the first one, I, uh, I thought uh, coming back uh, in 64, I think it was 64 or whatever, uh, one year, uh, the first time I really come back, come back and I, I was thinking of retiring, I don't know mentally if I was ready to retire. And, uh, and, and I didn't report to camp uh, because I was going to, you know, Stay retired, uh, but I I uh, I didn't uh, because the one thing she had become became the coach, and I and I, I room with she uh, was going to be a player coach. Uh, he wanted me to be a player coach, so I I says okay, so I come back for that, and then the second time I I thought uh, we were ready. Uh, the team was ready maybe to go for another championship. And I had retired, and, uh, and the guy that was supposed to take over from my position uh, was uh, uh, Don Thompson. And uh, they weren't happy with what he was doing, uh, so, they, so they called me back. And... Uh, and I and I uh, I felt good, you know, that they wanted me, but I really didn't want to come back uh, because uh, you know I didn't want to play the game. He's retired. I didn't want to be a what's that quarterback from Green Bay that retired thirty times or whatever his name is. You know, I didn't want to play that game. You know, I didn't. Uh, so so I didn't do it. Uh, then. Uh, they got into the after three or four exhibition games. Thompson wasn't making them happy. 
So uh, they called me back, Shu had called me back, and at that time I was still pretty much uh, in shape. So uh, my son, yeah. and the Colts, uh, they were all so good to me, I couldn't say no. So I said, okay, I, you know, we'll do it. And so we did that. And uh, the last time I, I, I come back was... Uh, Shua was in 1966, where uh, Shua was going for the championship. Everybody was hurt, so he asked me if I would come back. And I, I was still pretty good shape. I, was, I had been out of football a year and a half. And then uh, I went back. I worked my soul. It was halfway through the season that, when he had asked me to come back. And I had uh, worked myself in pretty good shape. And so uh, I went back, and uh, that was it. That day when I went home, I said, sure, don't call me anymore. (laughs) Thank you. But he was uh, was a great, great coach. Uh, He, he... I kind of run my business that, that way, the way the coaches, the ones I liked and disliked, and their good habits and bad habits. And like, uh, for instance, uh, Weeb, uh, you know, when Weeb come in, he brought organization. And Weeb was very, very smart offensive planner, getting game plans. And, uh, and, uh, also recruiting, uh, drafts. Uh, he knew everything from A to Z about football. What makes it, what makes it successful? And uh, and he had one major fault, and that was, uh, and I told him this. I'm, I'm not saying anything behind his back. I told him that uh, uh, he was too nice. Uh, he uh, has bad habits that way. He treats some players uh, uh, he like Alan Amici. You know, he didn't like Alan Amici. Nobody knew why he didn't like Alan Amici. Alan knew he didn't like him. But for some reason, uh, he didn't like him. And he, he would pick players or, that he wasn't he didn't like, and it would be obvious. And uh, eventually those players or the team starts to loosen up, you know, because they know that, uh, uh, well, like, for instance, me, I could do probably do what I wanted to do if I want, was that type of ball player. He, he wouldn't have said nothing to me or John or uh, if the third string makes a quarter uh, mistake uh, and, and John makes that same mistake, he would shoot the, the third string quarterback out, but wouldn't say nothing to John. So that that type of stuff just don't go. Eventually, uh, the football players uh, will take, advan- take advantage. And, and they did. After five or six years uh, coaching the Colts, he lost his job. And if you look at his record, when he went to the Jets, after five or six years, he lost his job. You know, because those guys become men, you know, and, uh, you know, they're making money and uh, having a lot of fun. You got, you, you just have to uh, control them now. And he just didn't do that. Shuler, on the other hand, he, God, he, he would chew you out if you made a mistake. I mean, he didn't care who you were. So he lasted longer as a head coach. He uh, and the players might not like him. They would tell you this, as I would tell you. You know, I didn't like a lot of things he would do, but I had the utmost respect for him, which I didn't have quite the respect, say, for Weeb uh, as as a head coach, uh, as I did Shula. Uh, Shula, Shula was tough, and the good thing about it. You always forgot, you know, as old saying, you forgive. If you if you forgive, you got to forget it. You, know, you can't carry it around with you every day. Uh, you just got to let it loose. If you, if you forgive, 
Now, if you can't forgive and you got to carry it around, then don't forgive. 